Okay, next talk. I'll give you one way to save the planet, not more, not less. Um, a way I believe uh, is bridging engineering and design. So I will continue what uh, Johannes started on, how uh, a designer made him a better developer. So just to start off, getting to know you a bit better. Could you, um, not uh, generalizing every, anyone here, but uh, could you raise your hand if you feel, uh, if you consider yourself being an engineer or a developer? A lot of you guys. And if you consider yourself being a designer? Yeah, we got some. Someone hasn't raised their hand yet? No, okay, yeah, one, one here. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so me and myself, I'm an engineer. I have a technical background from NTNU in cybernetics and robotics. And uh, today I will share with you all my presumptions and prejudices I had going into the fields of design with a heavily technical background. And I will also share with you the insights I've gained and some of my aha moments. Because what I come to realize is that during my five years at the university, I never really fully understood what design was. I haven't reflected on it. I didn't know uh, how that could be useful in my role as an engineer. So uh, it's a bit scary to tell someone about the, your presumptions about things. It could be like a bit judgmental, but this was it's just uh, that you don't know anything about the field. So this is what just my experience is going into it. Okay, so I think uh, I will just tie them, my insights all up in four aha moments. And uh, yeah, let's dive into those. First of all, it took me 27 years, I'm 27 now, so it took me 27 years before I began to reflect on what design was. And that's a bit weird as well, because I have a background from both being acting as a child and for, I love to craft stuff with my hands. Um, so I always think of myself as like, okay, I'm a creative individual. And I think of uh, creativity as something you, you can associate with design. However, I never felt like a designer or be going into the fields of design. So I couldn't really um, get those two things together. But what I come to realize after reflecting on design is that I think the word design itself makes us confused. Um, because um, I was thinking of, of, uh, of design as like architecture or in fashion, colors and shapes. Um, something fuzzy, something that didn't, didn't have two lines under the answer. Um, but what I come to realize is that I think it's because of the word. Because if you translate the word or the meaning of the sign in Norwegian, the sign, we would think of exactly those things I just mentioned. But if you translate the sign or, or have the meaning of it into Norwegian, it would be planlegge, forme, lage, uh, være kreativ. And if you, then I will translate those back again to English. It will be flat plan, form, create, compose, arrange, arrange, outline, and style. Some of those words. And I can be an engineer and do these kinds of words. So I think the biggest thing for me is was to realize that design isn't something that belongs to some people and doesn't belong to other people. It was just I hadn't thought of that before. So the first aha experience is that Design is not a foreign word for a developer or an engineer. Uh, when I solve a problem, I design the solution. Okay, so going into the fields of design, I realized that there was a lot of, uh, of concepts I didn't know about. So I'll just mention some for you. So it's design thinking and design methodology, service design, design sprint, design workshop, user-centered design, divergent and convergent thinking, journey mapping, brain writing, visual thinking, double diamond and double diamond sandwich. <laughs> uh, I made Dolly make me a double diamond sandwich because uh, what, what's that? However, um, diving deeper into it, I realized that these are only methods and frameworks helping me to work with um, problems in a structured way. So it's um, methodologies for creating innovative products that address real needs. Surprisingly, not that different from systems engineering. It's just going from one side or from the other. And that's also a thing about this bridging engineering and design. We speak about what we think is different things, but there are actually just different ways um, solving problems. 
And also this framework is what I've come to realize that creativity also thrives within structure and boundaries. Creativity isn't as I first thought was just like a free-flowing uh, state of mind when everything just comes to you. Just imagine standing in front of like a big white canvas. You're like, where do I begin? What kind of pencil? What kind of color? Which corner? What size am I going to write stuff? However, when you have the first stroke, you have a direction. You have an, um, a boundary for where to, to begin and for where to continue. And uh, so creativity, they, it thrive, thrives in the same boundaries and structure, so just as I like. Um, and also, I think that's, uh, that got me to realize why I think also a lot of uh, designers use like post-it notes because they're le really less terrifying than those big black, big white canvases. So the, the post-it notes are already giving them the boundaries of just starting off. It's giving them a color. So just write whatever you, comes to your mind then. So my second aha moment was that design methods, they aren't fuzzy. They are tangible. And they approach a problem in a structured way. And structure and boundaries are necessary to foster creativity and innovative solutions. I'll give you my uh, third aha uh -huh experience uh, right away. And that's, I need to understand the deep underlying needs to solve the right problem. Okay, said in other words, it's stupid to think that I know best. Um, imagine the scenario that you have like this large data set and you've been for a couple of weeks, you have been cleaning it and you have found a lot of interesting and valuable information in it, you think. And then you made this prototype just to test the, the data you have and that just get feedback on what people think of it. So you made an engineering interface. And then you get the feedback. And uh, two things happened. Firstly, the one you tested them with, they don't understand anything of the data you presented. And secondly, they, don't have, they, have, have, uh, they haven't used for the data that you spent a lot of time finding and it was a technical challenging task but it doesn't give any proper value and then I think it's with this in mind I think it's time for me to introduce you to uh, Shindugu I don't know if anyone have anyone heard about Shindugu before yeah nice it's a Japanese um, uh, word and it means the practice of inventing ingenious everyday gadgets that seem to be ideal solutions to particular problems, but which may cause more problems than they solve. Let's just give you an example. The lipstick guide. <laughs> Happy I didn't try that before I got on stage here today. This one is cool, the noodle cooler. <laughs> um, I find it already hard eating with sticks, so I don't think this would be easier. And my personal favorite, because I always fell asleep on all public transportation, the subway sleeper. <laughs> so what I want to say is that understanding the need is crucial to addressing the actual underlying problem. This girl didn't need something to support her head on the subway. She need more sleep, maybe a holiday or a better mattress. We need to address the actual underlying need. And for that to happen, we must put our biases aside and actually go out there and research the problem before we start heading for the solution. So design methodologies, methodologies could help us in channel our energies into solving the right problems by uncovering the genuine needs. So just to recap, I need to understand the, under the deep underlying needs to solve the right problem because I don't know best. Okay, I'll give you my aha, the last aha moment as well. Testing ideas and getting unbiased feedback will help me failing faster and succeed sooner. It's obvious that we need to test our stuff and it's obvious that we need feedback, but a lot of times I don't prioritize it when uh, I'm in a rush and I don't have that much time left. Um, and also, I kind of feel it a bit intimidating getting feedback sometimes because it may be something that you care about and that you spend a lot of time on. So when these two factors come into play, we 
tend to just turn around and just ask our neighboring uh, colleague or something about feedback to get to your application or your prototype. And that limits us from getting unbiased feedback and getting new perspectives because we actually just ask the people that's around us and have um, more of the same uh, uh, background as, as well as uh, ourselves. But I got one tip once, and that's I will share with you today. And that is to pretend that you didn't made, make the prototype. It was your colleague. Because sometimes when you ask for feedback, the people will always say, oh, that's so good, and, and you made a great job, and we want to cheer you up. But if you said, OK, I'm here to gather feedback for someone else, it's less intimidating for you because you can just distract a bit from the idea. And it's also less intimidating for the one you ask because he or she uh, or them don't, don't know um, uh, it's that it's your prototype. So that the tip is that you can say, my colleague made this user interface and I've been assigned to test it. What are your thoughts? Just to, to, uh, to uh, get a, um, just to not to be right in the moment and feel that it's your thing and that it's something you're really passionate about. So, um, yeah, and also just to think about the prototyping and the feedback, getting feedback, I think it should be a bit intimidating getting feedback on a prototype because if it's le not intimidating, then you work too much on it. Uh, and so that's also with the failing faster to succeed sooner, go out and test it, just as eBay did with their first launch. Uh, I think yeah, they got some feedback on that, I guess. Yeah, so that was the fourth. Testing ideas and getting unbiased feedback will help me failing faster and succeed sooner. Okay, so design fields always use journey maps. So where am I at? I've got these aha moments, and I know that to be the best developer and engineer that I can be, I need to remember these aha moments. And I'm at this stage that I just uh, packed my backpack, I got my map and my compass, and I don't know where I'm heading into the fields of design. I don't know uh, exactly how to get there either. But what I do know is that fields of design can help me solve the right problems. And what the second thing I know is that what comes ahead is climate change and its sustainability. And then we need to ensure that we are actually solving the right problems. We are great problem solvers, but it doesn't make sense to solve the wrong ones. We must put our efforts and energy into the one that really matters. I also come to realize that it's only two to three design sprints away. Not to be like a doomsday talk here now, but, but if I find it ex um, um, ex um, exciting that, or inspiring that now that we're only two to three design sprints away, it means only two to three in, uh, product development, pro development process away from 2030, we need to know now that we're working on the right stuff. We can't wait to next year or next month because it's only two to three sprints away. And for me to be the best developer I can be or engineer I can be uh, is not about solving problem problems. It's, solving, it's about solving the right ones. And for that to happen, I need to build design methodology into my practice, not bolt it on afterwards. So, yeah, I think I spoke a bit fast today, but <laughs> yeah, that was what I had. So, thank you. <laughs>